Yeah, I also would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this extremely interesting symposium. And yeah, uh, I think the most fundamental problem that every organism has to solve at each moment in time is to decide what to do next, that is to choose from the repertoire of possible action, one that is sufficiently suited to serve the needs and goals of the organisms and uh, suits to uh, prevent harm from the organism. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that even what we call higher thought or cognitive control capacities ultimately evolved as answers to this fundamental problem of action selection. Now, in the course of evolution, uh, I think humans have developed uh, a, a number of remarkable features, um, like, for instance, expanded future time perspective, enabling us to anticipate long-term goals or even our own future need states, uh, the ability to exert self-control uh, over habitual or impulsive responses, and finally, the ability to very flexibly and rapidly reconfigure our behavioral dispositions to changing goals or task demands. Uh, the, the main message I want to make, however, is that although the evolution of these capacities dramatically expanded the flexibility and degrees of freedom of action uh, selection and decoupled, in a sense, action from the immediate environment and the immediate need state, it, this all came at a cost in terms of qualitatively novel kinds of conflicts, which I like to term control dilemmas, uh, which pose certain meter control problems to goal-directed agents. Now, in the psychology of action and volition, it has often been stressed that cognitive control or self-control is in the service of intention shielding. So, for instance, in psychological theories of volition, you find uh, uh, quotations like, once an intention is formed, it is protected from distracting information or competing goals. Uh, likewise, in cognitive neuroscience of cognitive control, it is stressed that the fundamental aspect of control is to select weaker task-relevant responses uh, in the face of competition from otherwise stronger responses. And also in philosophical action theory, the idea has been very prominent that intentions have a special persistence. They, they so to speak, resist reconsideration and seem to be shielded against competing goals and intentions. Uh, and, and obviously, this is a very important and beneficial thing to have. So when we think, uh, leave the laboratory and think of everyday life conflicts, we very often face conflicts like uh, these ones. And we all know all too often we go for that alternative, I guess, even though we know what the long-term consequences of our behavior uh, may be. And so clearly, self-control and the ability to exert self-control in such situations seems to be a beneficial thing. And also in more mundane example, uh, or maybe I can just show you some preliminary data from an experience sampling study we did showing that in fact the laboratory tasks that we use do seem to have some validity in, in, in addressing that kind of self-control ability. So here we had participants uh, seven days uh, um, a week. We probed them at, at uh, six or seven times a day. Uh, was a small questionnaire via smartphones asking them, did you experience a desire that was in conflict with your long-term goals? And in the laboratory, we had a kind of uh, Stroop task measuring error-related brain activity in control networks, and we did indeed see uh, that there's a relation between activation in the ACC and right IFJ uh, in, relation, in, in response to errors, and the frequency, the proportion uh, with which subjects report to give in to these temptations in everyday life, suggesting, I think, uh, that indeed the task we use seem to have some ecological validity here. Now, in more mundane situations, it's also clear, for instance, these are the German tax uh, report forms that we once in a while have to fill in. So when you focus on such a task, it's, it's clearly important there's a lot of alternative options in the environment that may trigger alternative goals. So clearly, again, it's important to be able to shield that task from all these uh, alternative affordances. But it's almost trivial to state, of course, there are situations where the world may change unexpectedly, and exactly the, the opposite is important. We have to rapidly switch. We have to disengage from the current goal and it wouldn't be very adaptive, like for instance in some volition theories that assume if we then would increase shielding of the current goal and, and stick to that task. We obviously have to do the opposite. Now while that may seem trivial from an everyday life standpoint, I think it's computationally and psychologically far from trivial how the brain does compute constantly all the costs and benefits of these latent options relative to the current goal in order to decide should I continue shielding my goal or, or should I switch and explore 
uh, some alternative goals. So that's basically uh, what fascinates us and the reason why I'm calling this control dilemma is that we assume that there's really complementary costs and benefits of these uh, different control modes. So while strong goal shielding gives you advantages in terms of stability of behavior, persistence, reduced interference, it also has a cost side in terms of risk of perseveration, impaired background monitoring for things that might come up in the environment and might be potentially important. On the other hand, weak goal shielding may also have its advantages in terms of cognitive flexibility, increased sensitivity for potential things that may be relevant in the environment, but of course the cost side is obvious. It may lead to a volatile behavior and increased distractibility. Now, we assume that we have a whole, whole list of these control dilemmas by now. Actually, it's even longer now. Uh, but I only want to talk about the first two of them, the shielding, shifting, and selection monitoring. And we associate these dilemmas with certain control parameters or meter control parameters, like the updating threshold and the attention breadth. And to make this a little bit more uh, concrete, if you think of uh, goal maintenance in terms of attractor networks, uh, where goals are maintained in some kind of neural activation pattern, which then top-down modulates a task-relevant processing systems, then you can easily think that this system may operate in two very different states. In one way, you have deep attractor basings, basins, strong recurrent connection, which gives you robust maintenance, resistance to interference, and on the other hand, in a state where the attractor basins are re relatively shallow, giving you flexible updating capability, but also susceptibility to interference. And this is one of the reasons why we think these are states that are kind of functionally and computationally incompatible. You can't be in both of these states at the same time. So to summarize that introduction, adaptive action control from that perspective is an optimization problem that confronts agents with the fundamental challenge how to balance the requirement of behavioral stability and persistence against the need for flexibility and interruptibility. A point I should mention or could, should give credit to Alan Allport who made the point 25 years ago in a very nice paper on attention. So a question clearly is what determines the setting of these control parameters? How is the balance between these complementary control modes regulated? Ultimately, how is control itself controlled? Now we assume that there's nothing like a central executive doing these computations and decisions, but we are focusing on a number of kind of bottom-up signals like conflict signals, phasic negative effect, positive effect, reward cues, but also state variables like acute stress and associated neuromodulatory systems. I will talk a little bit about the conflict and positive effect aspects today. So I will present three exemplary strands of data, some older, some unpublished. First on conflict-triggered regulation of control, the second on the cost of conflict-triggered goal shielding, and finally about the emotional modulation of cognitive control. Now starting with conflict-triggered regulation, it's, it's a very old idea dating back to early will psychology. Uh, Nazis Ach already made the point that conflicts automatically trigger, as he <coughs> called it, an intensified exertion of volition in order to attain a goal. Uh, much more well-known, I guess, is the conflict monitoring theory making essentially the same point, that conflicts registered in medial uh, prefrontal areas serve as signals for the recruitment of increased control, presumably uh, mediated by the uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, which then increases top-down control to reduce susceptibility to the next conflict, for instance, in an interference task. <clears throat> And uh, as you, I guess everybody knows here, uh, the most important behavioral evidence for this model are sequential conflict adaptation effects. I guess everybody is familiar with this. I can be very brief on this. If you have a look at interference tasks, like such a flanker interference task, and you have a look at certain trial transitions from a congruent to another, to an incongruent trial, and compare these to transitions from an incongruent to an incongruent trial, then you typically see that the interference from the flanking stimuli is uh, substantially reduced following conflict, and this, of course, fits nicely with the idea that conflict triggered enhanced recruitment of control. And there's been a kind of industry the past 10, 15 years on these effects. They are, on the one hand, seemingly fairly robust in different kinds of interference tasks, but I should also mention there's some discussion about alternative interpretations, about confounding factors like episodic priming, feature integration, contingency learning, and I will keep this part of the discussion completely out of my talk. This may be something for discussion. My reading of the literature and there's recent reviews uh, 
uh, supporting this, that even if you try to control for these confounds, which are clearly have an effect, usually these conflict adaptation effects survive, suggesting that there's a genuine control-related component to them. But that's, of course, currently uh, a controversial issue. Now, one thing that we were interested in is, these, is the uh, fine-grained time course of these effects. So usually, uh, conflict adaptation is really a su um, conceived of a sequential process. So have, have a conflict in a certain trial in a task, and then in preparation of the next trial, control is recruited. Uh, and we ask ourselves, couldn't it be the case that this is a kind of online continuous process? That within a trial, when the conflict arises, there's immediately uh, a kind of contrast enhancement such a, that the currently irrelevant goal is shielded, attention is focused on relevant information, and irrelevant information is suppressed, not in preparation for the next trial, but simply in the course of response selection on the current conflict trial. Now, how can one tap into that temporal dynamics? And my then a PhD student, now an assistant professor in Dresden, Stefan Scherbaum, came up with, I think, a kind of clever idea. He used a standard flanker-type task where you have to respond to the central target, disregard the flanking stimuli, which can be compatible or incompatible. But the new idea was to have the stimuli flickering at different frequencies. So you can see the target and the flanking stimuli are flickering at different frequency, which gives you the possibility to derive steady state evoked potentials in the EG, SSVPs. And the nice thing about these SSVPs is that they are sensitive to attention. Um, so when you attend to certain stimulus, usually you get a larger SSVP response. And we thought, well, this gives us an online signature of the allocation or the shielding of attention within a conflict trial. That's basically the idea. So the prediction here was that when you encounter a conflict, you have target and distractor evoking competing response tendencies then within the few hundred milliseconds of response selection, you would get a contrast enhancement such that the target information uh, produces a stronger signal in the SSVP and the distractor information is increasingly suppressed. And that's in fact what we found. You see here the difference curve, the difference between the SSVP as on conflict and no conflict trials and you see exactly that kind of contrast enhancement that we had predicted. Now, we then went one step further and, and reasoned, if the control state that is reached at the end of such a conflict trial, if that persists until the next trial, then no further control adjustments are needed in order to cope with the subsequent conflict. So prediction would be the SSVP contrast enhancement should disappear on trials following conflict. And in fact, I did show you only half of the data, namely the data from trials where the previous trial was a congruent one. But if you have a look at trials where the previous trial already invoked a conflict, the contrast enhancement in the SSVP completely disappears, suggesting that conflict adaptation, at least under certain conditions, may just be a passive carryover of control settings established on the previous conflict trial. Now, we try to simulate this in a, in a, in a uh, very simple, simple type of uh, uh, neural attractor network, and I don't want to go into details, just uh, giving the main point here, what we try to show is that even if you have no explicit conflict monitoring module, no kind of neural layer that is measuring conflict, but you just uh, exploit the processing dynamics and time. Just the fact that conflict trials usually take longer to settle into a stable response state gives the network more time to settle into a state where the go uh, correct goal is uh, enhanced and distracting information is inhibited. And in fact, we did see a show that this model can produce conflict adaptation effects and also, at least qualitatively, uh, can capture our SSVP findings. Okay, now let me, coming back to the idea of these complementary benefits and costs, briefly say some things, uh, some sentences about the cost of these processes. In the beginning, I said it's a very good thing to have this kind of conflict trigger goal shielding uh, and this may even predict daily self-control failures to a certain degree but what, what about the cost side and one thing that comes immediately to mind is if it is true that conflict automatically increases goal shielding then this is advantages in terms of reduced interference from competing task sets but it also might increase the task switch costs so if you have after such a conflict try to switch to something different this may be more difficult. And in fact, there's 
a couple of studies uh, now out, one older, one of myself, showing exactly this, that the switch cost in typical test switching experiments is increased following high conflict trials. And this has then been replicated, extended by Brown, Braver and others, and also by Coquelin and colleagues, uh, all showing the same pattern of this increased switch cost following conflict. On the neural side, there's also been findings from several groups showing that after, or after conflict, when you then have a look at task switch related brain activity, you see, in fact, increased activity in control related areas like the DLPFC. We ourselves, in an unpublished uh, study, had, uh, had a look at EG signatures. Uh, and it's well known that when you compare repetition and switch trials, you see target related a smaller or attenuated <coughs> P3 component. And this has been interpreted as, as an index that the system is not fully prepared for the new task after a switch, that there's still interference that has to be overcome from previous task set and so on and so forth. And what we did, we had a look at what about what, what happens to this P3 attenuation following trials where there was no conflict on the previous trial. And what we saw when you have a look at conflict preceded trials, you do in fact see that this P3 attenuation is substantially larger, indicating again that the conflict on the previous trial led to increased shielding of the current goal, making it more difficult, more effortful to switch to the alternative task as indicated by this P3 attenuation. I skip over one thing that was already mentioned by Paul in his talk about the prospective memory. There we showed that also background monitoring for prospective memory cues seems to be, uh, seems to suffer from conflict in an ongoing task, but I will go don't go into this. So taken together, I think this fits nicely with this idea of complementary costs and benefits so far. But still, the question uh, remains, um, what are variables regulating the balance between this complementary uh, costs and benefits? And this brings me to the final part. And I will t uh, show you a little bit about the things we and others have done on the role of emotions in the modula modulation of these complementary control modes. Now, we started out with a very simple working hypothesis, and hopefully in the next uh, few minutes I will make this hypothesis much, more, much less elegant and much more uh, complex in, in, in a way. But there has been, have been ideas around for quite some time that, for instance, conflicts and errors are aversive effective signals themselves, so that, that it may actually be their aversive effective quality that drives some of the effects we see in conflict and error monitoring studies. And one prediction clearly is that if that is the case, then one should see certain interactions or modulations when we induce phasic negative or positive effect, this should modulate the effects we see in conflict and monitoring. And I don't have to have the time to give here uh, something like a review of these studies. Let me just say that we were interested in this hypothesis whether conflict signals, phasic negative effect, shifts the system towards more conflict trigger goal shielding, whereas positive effect, or one may say safety signals, shift the system, other things being equal, more in the direction of attenuated goal shielding. And one example of a study we did with the uh, colleagues in Magdeburg was we used the standard Flanker test, which evoked a lot of errors and had a look at the error-related negativity in the ERP. Uh, and prior to each flanker stimuli, we presented a neutral, uh, a negative, or a positive effective picture and did, in fact, see that the ERN was significantly increased following the negative pictures. There's now been quite a number of studies also showing uh, that positive effect has the reverse effect of reducing the ERN, at least in some studies this has been successfully been shown. Now, one thing that, was, that we found very interesting, having a look at the uh, shielding shifting balance in terms of the updating threshold that I talked about before. So how would positive effect influence the updating threshold? And we started this 10 years ago. Now, uh, some of you might know this, this older experiment, and I'm reporting this for, for a certain reason here again. Uh, what we did there is that we had subjects respond to numbers, for instance, in one condition. They had to decide if the red number is odd or even, and they could ignore the green number for quite a number of trials. Then there was a switch, and, and one switch condition, they had to switch to a new target category in the color blue. So in that condition, the targets were novel stimuli, but the distractors 
were still the old targets. So the requirement is here to not to perseverate, to disengage from the previous target category. In the second switch condition, which we term the distractibility condition, the distractors were the novel stimuli, so they, those were in blue. You had to ignore something that was new in the task. And the targets were the old distractors. And the idea being, if positive effect would induce a bias towards something that is new and reduces perseveration, this should be helpful in the perseveration condition, but should uh, worse, lead to worse performance in the distractibility condition. So we did, again, this manipulation with the uh, effective pictures, positive or neutral pictures, prior to each such display. And we did, in fact, see uh, that the switch cost in the distractibility condition was increased following the positive pictures, but in the perseveration condition, it was reliably decreased. And the reason I'm presenting this, I mean, these days, there's rightly so a lot of discussion about replicability and false positives. And we were very happy that this pattern has almost identically been replicated by Liu and Bang in, in uh, last year. Uh, this is only part of their data. They had a second condition. But this is the one condition which uh, is almost identical to ours also in terms of the uh, effective manipulation. So we're, we're really happy having seen this uh, replicated. And I should add, and I can be very open in, in this in the discussion, we actually do, I mean, I'm presenting the nice things here, but we do have a hard time sometimes to see these uh, effective uh, uh, effects, and uh, every time I'm talking to uh, people doing this kind of research, they're telling me it's, it's, it, it's a nightmare uh, doing this research on, on emotions. So I'm just saying this here to be really very frank on this. Uh, you usually see effects, they are replicable, but it seems there's a lot of moderator variables, often unknown, that seem to make these effects really fragile, but this may be something also for, for discussion. Uh, one interesting thing, though, is, um, and this again is something that has been replicated, we saw, in, interestingly, in, in, a, in a different set of studies, exactly the same pattern uh, that I showed you for the positive effect manipulation when we classified subjects according to their spontaneous eye blink rates. So, subjects showing a high spontaneous eye blink rate showed virtually the pattern that the positive effective stimuli had induced. And this has also recently been replicated almost identical. Uh, the reason I find that interesting is that eye blink rates have been suggested to be a, a very indirect marker of tonic, uh, uh, presumably striatal uh, dopamine levels. Uh, I've scanned the literature. I think there's not really direct evidence for this. There's suggestive evidence. Um, and it's, of course, interesting because there's models out there suggesting that increases in tonic dopamine levels in the striatum and basal ganglia may shift the overall balance of processing towards flexible switching and increased distractibility. And we are now doing combined PET and pharmacological imaging studies to really have a more closer look at whether these effects of positive effect may be mediated by dopamine changes in the basal ganglia. But that, that's ongoing work. I don't have any data on this. Now, a second strand uh, of research on, on this question, uh, we addressed the attention breadth and the selection monitoring balance. And the question here being, would positive effect lead to increased background monitoring and more distributed mode of attention compared to the more goal-shielded and focused attention mode after conflict signals or negative effect? And to test this, we used uh, um, a visual search task. These are unpublished data. So subjects here had to... Uh, detect as fast as possible if the display contain, contains a target, which was an orientation deviant. And sometimes the display contained a color singleton, which was completely irrelevant. So subjects knew throughout the experiment they never had to respond to the color deviant. And again, we used that simple method presenting, briefly presenting effective pictures prior to each search display. And in two independent experiments now, uh, my doctoral student, Irena Domachowska, could in fact show that the target, the distractor effect evoked by the presence of the uh, distractor was increased when the uh, search trials were preceded by a positive effective picture. We also showed this in a dual task, but for time reasons, how, how much time do I have? Okay, then I'll skip the dual task study. Four minutes, perfect. <laughs> Well, basically, we, we showed that, that dual task interference is increased after in, in positive mood, but this is basically uh, more of the same. Uh, 
I would like to take the final minutes to, to add two complications. The first uh, is related to the question, is positive effect similar in its effects to reward? And I think there's now a very clear answer, and I can be relatively short on this. We uh, did a review last year of this literature, and while we see some consistency, the task ir irrelevant positive effect seems to reduce maintenance and shielding and increase distractibility. There's a very clear pattern that performance contingent reward, so when subjects expect to be rewarded for doing the task, has exactly the re reverse effect. So you see increased goal shielding, better maintenance, increased proactive control. So this is, has clearly been to be kept sub, um, um, apart, task irrelevant, positive effect, and performance contingent reward. Second complication with respect to negative effect. Does phasic negative effect have similar effects as state-like negative states, for instance, acute stress? And again, our tentative answer is no. So we did a couple of studies using a standardized stress induction protocol, the social uh, TRIA social stress test developed by my colleague Clemens Kirschbaum. So subjects here have to face uh, a mock job interview where they have to do public speaking, do some mental arithmetic, and that's a very unresponsive panel, very serious. They are being videotaped. And, and this uh, evokes, a in most, most subjects, a very reliable stress response, also evident in the cortisol re response. So it's a very powerful manipulation. And interestingly, I will just show you two pieces of, of uh, data from these studies. The first is when we had a look at conflict adaptation after the stress induction. And what you see here is the conflict adaptation index, or so the reduction in interference following conflict, you see in the control subjects across blocks that this slightly increased. They, they were getting even more sensitive to conflict, whereas in the stressed subjects there was a reduction in the conflict adaptation effect, suggesting they became increasingly sens uh, less sensitive to the conflict signals. And the second piece of data, we had a probabilistic learning task, which allowed us to have a look at how much used subject positive feedback, reward feedback, or negative feedback to learn this probabilistic uh, task. And again, we see in the stressed subjects that they showed a significant tendency to significantly less use the negative feedback. And there was a non-significant trend uh, in the, the reverse trend for the positive feedback, but this was not reliable. Now, why is that interesting? First of all, it shows these kind of state-like negative effective states seem to be qualitatively different from the phasic conflict and negative affect signals I uh, talked about before. And secondly, I think this fits nicely with recent ideas that sustained negative effect, or what you may term relate to mental fatigue, stress states, may also be adaptive signals, but have very different effects, namely that sustained effortful control may become increasingly aversive, so that stress and mental fatigue may be signals which signal the opportunity cost of task persistence and goal shielding, and then have exactly the opposite effect, namely motivating the disengagement from the current task and the shift to a different, intrinsically more rewarding goal. And this may, may account, this is post hoc, we, we didn't plan the stress experiments that way, but now having a look at this literature, our findings would fit with the idea that in a stressful state, subjects increasingly tend to disregard conflict signals and get a, have a bias towards reward signals and maybe exploration alternative goals. So I think the story now is much more complex than our simple starting hypothesis. So I do think we have fairly consistent evidence that conflict signals and also phasic negative effect shift the system towards increased uh, goal shielding. There's also evidence I showed you in the final part very preliminary, though, that stress and mental fatigue may have exactly the reverse effect, shifting the system towards disengagement, towards exploration. I showed you some evidence that task irrelevant positive effect also affect low in approach motivation, um, seems to attenuate goal shielding, while performance contingent reward, and I didn't talk about this positive <coughs> effect, high in approach motivation seems again have to have the opposite effect of increasing goal shielding and proactive control. So slightly more or somewhat more complex picture, I think closer to the truth than our very simple hypothesis we started our 10 years ago from now. So to conclude, I think I convinced you that control dilemmas may be a useful concept to use in dealing with this question. I 
gave you some evidence for the complementary benefits and costs of gold shielding. I uh, showed you the complexities of the emotional modulations. And of course, there's a whole bunch of questions. How exactly are the benefits and costs of these complementary control modes learned and computed? And, and uh, Etienne, I think, has a very in interesting approach to this question. How, how can, for instance, via Bayesian inference, uh, these uh, benefits and costs of different control modes be, be learned? Uh, then how do emotional modulations relate to neuromodulatory influences? And finally, do dysfunctional meta-control parameters maybe contribute also to certain mental disorders? Now, these are all questions we address in our collaborative research centers, so I have to thank all the colleagues in that center uh, for spending so much time and effort in addressing questions uh, that are also interesting for me. And of course, I should uh, thank my PhD students and, and uh, postdocs, especially the emotional uh, emotion group, Annette Bolte, Irena Domachowska, Ulrike Schulz, the dynamics of control group, Stefan Scherbaum, and the self-control group, Martin Krönke and Max Wolf, and also the cognitive control, intentional action people, Rico Fischer, Hannes Ruge, and Stefanie Beck for all the marvelous work they're doing in the lab. And I thank you, of course, for your kind attention.